watching another episode of Top of the Morning. So don't touch that remote. We'll be right back. Quicker than you can say a van. That's American Visionary Arts Museum. Special exhibit because we're in beautiful downtown Baltimore where there's so much going on all the time. But for the moment, we've stopped everything traffic, sound, noise, almost all the noise, as you can hear in the background. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and we're going to take a special tour of the American Visionary Arts. That's right. And we have a wonderful artist with us, Frank Warren. He was actually at Artomatic in DC. He's launching his, his exhibit. It's called Post Secret Postcards with Little Personal Secrets written on it. And it's really exciting. I can't wait to see it. Almost like postcards on the edge. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Should be fun. Just so you all know, we're not currently inside the museum. We're outside in a little secret garden where they have many receptions nearby. They're building behind us. And they hold weddings here, parties. That's right. They hold private receptions uh, here. Make sure you check it out. And let's have a word from the founder and curator of the American Visionary Arts Museum. It's Rebecca Hoffberger. That's right. Right now. We have a difficulty of uh, parking, apologize, uh, the construction workers get here at 5 a.m. and people <laughs> some pretty good spots out there. And we also have a uh, inflated staff as uh, we're doing, uh, finishing up the installation. So there's a lot more cars around at this hour So uh, again, we apologize, but thank you for making that and taking the time out today um, to come to this show. Um, and I'll leave it at that, just know I can help you with anything, um, again, regarding information about the museum, about uh, all things beautiful. And uh, I had a little nightmare last night, so I'm going to uh, uh, perhaps exercise this with you. Zoroastrianism. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Zip, zip, zip. All things beautiful, from atheism to Zoroastrianism. Respect for diversity of belief. Uh, Rebecca Hoffberger, the founder and director of the museum and the curator of the show. Thank you so much. <laughs> Does that mean there's an O missing from the... No, it's all good. It's all good. Okay, thank you. Uh, actually, in the role, the creation of religion, one of the, the big aspects is the impermanence of life. And from our artists, the Dervish Sufi, here, Sermon Aslan, you'll see his series of paintings today, which deal with the fact that he lost his mother at the age of four, and what that did to awaken him. You'll see that repeated in many ways. Geraldine Lloyd here with another loss uh, when she lost her voice to cancer after being someone known for her voice. So often we say about visionary artists, when the life experience is too big for words, it comes off with this powerful art that speaks so many words. So today, besides the members of the press, we also have our small army of volunteer, soon to be, uh, I don't like the word docents, but I guess uh, uh, knowledgeable guides to the exhibition, to large groups that may come in and, and wish that. We usually have so much text, that it can be self-guided and a very rich experience as well. But it's wonderful when someone takes the time to learn the show and to lead people through and to tell what they will hear that can't go into the text from the artists today that they'll pick up. So to the docents that have come today to learn the show from all of us, thank you so much for your time. It's a thankless job, but it's a, <laughs> I'm very glad that you're all here. Now, this show, we will turn 12 years old this in this Thanksgiving season. This is our 13th mega exhibition. And I have to say, having been here from the beginning, it is, I think, the most beautiful show. The grounds, thanks to Joe Wall and his team, uh, William and Eric, 
and others are the cleanest. Now we battle all the construction debris every single day from the Ritz-Carlton. So the fact that the whole campus is so shining, I thank them. And then the show, we have our resident uh, exhibition designer, Mark Ward here with his team. Mark, for the first time, would you could you come up and give the names of everybody who works so hard? I've never done this because it can be kind of like boring for people, but in this case, people have to be acknowledged because everybody gave so much more of themselves than ever before. It was like 120%. This is Mark Ward. Hello. It starts with Rebecca, who is a curator, not only the director, but also the curator of this exhibition. And it's a very important exhibit. I know it's very near, near and dear to Rebecca's heart. Um, but just to run down the names quickly, Alex Lynn, who's been working for about six or seven years now on this team, Harry McMahon, which is the same, Todd Rainey, Caleb Heller, Brendan Hughes, Sandra Jones, Dylan Hay, Kristen Faber, and Sarah McGeeta. So I'd like to thank all of them, and I'd like for you to hear their names. And Frank Warren, I'd like to especially thank you for uh, helping with the postcards. Thank you. It's like a SWAT team that, that, that Mark oversees, you know, that he comes in, because it's a, it's a special case work. Uh, even at the most glorious of the world's well-funded museums, you won't see any greater care taken to how the objects are displayed and the text is displayed. Text has been done better by the best of all text makers, by Teresa Segretti. So you'll notice that, which enhances. She came up and made her own font, which includes many of the symbols of many of the world's major religions within the font. So look at that very carefully. Teresa's in the back there hanging out. <laughs> She's also the mother of Teresa of Ars Kinetic Sculpture. <laughs> Really, it's all my staff. Uh, Pete, you outdid yourself with that boulder, with that huge poster. That's really fantastic. How much did that cost us to get it? <laughs> it's good. Oh, okay. <laughs> and the game, the right hand here makes everything better, too. All right. Well, you know, when you gave names, you always uh, leave out people, so I'm, I'm frightened of that. So, uh, to everybody on the staff, this one, it has a special energy in this extra. So on hand today, we have a few to go with Bishop Devon to do when and, and we paired it with Rosiano and the the Art Museum. Now how much more of a perfect way right, to express the nature of the American Visionary Art Museum can you have than Rosie O'Donnell, Archbishop Tutu, and the whirling gig maker, eight-year-old Wallace Simpson. It was a quite a ten-year um, celebration, but his heart was very moved. So we've asked him to serve as the uh, as the head of our, um, of our advisory spiritual council, which includes atheists from the social, uh, ethical uh, societies, uh, uh, as well as rabbis and imams and uh, uh, different denominations of Christianity. And today I'm very happy because our garden was made very beautiful by someone who then hung up her gardening uh, trowel and uh, decided to go back and become an Episcopalian clergy. And that's Stuart Stewart who is here as well. Within the artists themselves, we have some ordained clergy. Or, uh, and that is one, we have uh, Reverend Richard Emanuel who is here, and you'll see that. And if he wasn't a reverend, I couldn't put his art in the show because it's that strong and it needs to come from that level of uh, sincere voice. <coughs> And Sorbet Aslan, he doesn't like to be called a Sufi master, so I won't say that. Um, but he has um, passed all five initiations. I think he's the only one in the country that has done that of Sufism. He was here for last year's Rumi Festival. He's up with his daughter, Jelan from uh, Charleston. Uh, and we have Bia Perkins and sister um, uh, uh, Mary Proctor. Uh, so there's a lot of kind of clergy artists in this show as well. Now, uh, all of the artists, could you please 
stand if you have a piece of artwork in the show, just so that people can see your face, the press, and know you're, you're going to be speaking in front of your works. But uh, Reagan and everybody, Geraldine, okay, let me have you up here. <laughs> Right, you'll get to hear lots more from them when we actually go through the exhibition. Now, the scientist, Andy Newberg, uh, a medical doctor who wrote several books, but the one that captivated my heart was he called Why God Won't Go Away. And it's Andy's brain scans that you will see uh, from different meditators from all different disciplines, Catholic nun, Tibetan priest, you know, an atheist who does GM, uh, a, a Christian who speaks in tongues. We look at, uh, at uh, he looks at their brain physiology and how it changes from their relaxed state into what happens when they perform uh, a very focused meditation. It's really kind of fascinating, and uh, you will see that also in this today. So, why I'm bringing up all of these different factors is that we have a very original formula. Uh, here at the American Missionary Art Museum that I hope will stretch on into forever, even if we have our West Coast branch, you know, in a few years. The exhibitions will still start here, but they will go out to Los Angeles. And here is the formula. Every year, we pick one grand spiritual theme that has bedeviled or inspired humankind from the very beginning. And then, we look at the world's most in tune with that theme, self-taught visionary artists who weren't given an assignment to try to cook up something on that theme, but that is the theme that has been bedeviling them or inspiring them as a muse throughout the creation of their own art. So we gather that, all these different voices that have manifested the art, and then we look for the world's wisdom around that sacred subject, the most creative thoughts that have been thought about that particular spiritual theme, or spirited theme. And then we look at the humor, and then we look at the uh, scientific relationship to that theme, and then we add the social justice underpinning uh, that is related to that theme. So in the case of where I brought up um, Archbishop Desmond Tutu and Rosie O'Donnell, we had an exhibition for our 10th anniversary on character, and the original working name of that show was Race, Class, and Gender. Three things that contribute zero to character because being a schmuck is an equal opportunity for everybody. <laughs> so uh, the short name was uh, Race, Class, and Gender do not equal character, and it was a very healing show. Now, you know, polite company always says, don't talk about, you know, like, you know, it's not PC to speak about religion and politics. But we live in a time where those factors are in our face and in our lives and have been uh, a great force for manipulation uh, all over the earth. Um, I love the Houston Smith quote, which is, we have to make a very sharp distinction between authentic religion and hijacked religion. Authentic religion promotes peace, period. No exceptions. So this exhibition does not seek to preach. It, it rather seeks to set the table for people of all ages and background to come and to feast. It is dedicated to the great dervish uh, poet who was born 800 years ago this past September 30th, this September 30th, just a couple days ago on Sunday, which happened to be Ramadan. So instead of repeating our first very beautiful uh, Rumi fest, we collaborated with the Maryland Muslim Council and we held, uh, they had fasted all day long for Ramadan, a break fast here and a pre-pre-tour, even before our own members had seen it, of the Rumi Festival. Because since 9-11, I think many of our Muslim neighbors and friends must feel very odd, odd man out. And we wanted to say, we realize that yours is a faith that was based with the word in Islam, you know, 
Islam in Salam, in peace. And we want to help underscore that that is the heart of most of the Muslims of the world and not the caricature that you see uh, portrayed so often in the news. And it is a great sadness to them as well for the portion of their, of their community that has been, has caused destruction. It's, it's, it's great and anger for them, or more so than for us. But it would be as if we condemned all of Christianity for the, what happened with the Inquisition and the KKK, etc. So I think we have to, um, in Rumi's way, remember that it's the path of the heart that always makes, makes the difference in faith. Um, I was worried with people trying to embrace people of orthodoxy in any of the major religions that the fact that we, our exhibition is called All Faiths Beautiful from Atheism to Zoroastrianism, Respect for Diversity of Belief, would be off-putting atheists because the quick thing to say, oh, godless, we won't know what they do, no moral code, but in fact, um, it's very clear in this exhibition some surprising facts about atheism as a belief system and agnosticism, and we'll save that for the show. Now, Baltimore, what a place to launch this exhibition. Did you know that our own board chairman, Sandra Beck Zaman, her great-grandfather with his brother Isaac, Isaac and William Fould, F-U-L-D, first patented the Ouija board right here in Baltimore. Yes. And then you may know that Baltimore, the first American Catholic saint, Mother Elizabeth Seton, also Baltimore, all right? And then the other quirky thing is when uh, the most infamous atheist in America, on the grounds of uh, separation of church and state, First Amendment, Madeline Murray O'Hare. Where was she living when she took prayer out of school? Baltimore. <laughs> so there's a lot of, of these voices that are here, and it's it's kind of wonderful to recognize that we are in the state of Maryland. Last, uh, uh, I guess it was February, I received the Loyola College Award called the Andrew White Award, the Jesuit Award. And they said, you know, it's, it's Maryland week, and we just want to underscore that Maryland was the first colony to pass legislation, you know, that to, uh, 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 for religious tolerance, very famous piece of legislation. And I said, yeah, but did you know that it applied only to Christians? You know, so we say, we hear tolerance, we hear it with modern ears, and, and they repealed it because they thought it was too liberal in a few years. So they, even that was, that was too wide for them. But it's very beautiful that we are in Maryland. Maryland was, um, I think, the only Catholic colony. But you're also going to hear from the founder of Rhode Island, who back in the 17th century, uh, uh, Roger Williams, uh, founded Rhode Island to be totally, sincerely, religiously free. And he said the best thing that I think is so modern for today, this is his exact words, okay, no modernity, you know, added. Forced worship stinks in God's nostrils. <laughs> so the, there's a lot of lovely surprises on the history part of the show. So, oh, uh, I think I'm, oh, in, in tribute to the fact that America's First Amendment covers both freedom of speech, freedom of press, you gotta love that, uh, as well as, as freedom to express your religion in any, or your faith, your belief system, in any matter of conscience that is true to your own determination. Um, we are celebrating 88-year-old, she'll be by then, Helen Thomas, at our March 15th, Beware the Eyes of March, our March 15th gala uh, fundraiser. We only hold one a year, and uh, we're very excited to have her. And don't, this is not for print, but I'm trying to get Stephen Colbert, loves her to introduce her because he does love her so much and he uh, is a very fine 
know, he was raised Catholic and he teaches Sunday school. And I thought he would do a great job of defining faith. I'm going to send him our own Reverend Howard Finster, America's most prolific outsider artist quote, faith and worry can't live in the same heart. One has to go. So we, we hope to get him. And we're also extending an invitation to someone else who loves Helen Thomas. And that is Bill Maher. Now Bill Maher uh, has been working on, it will be ready by then, a new film called, and remember he is a very famous atheist, called Religion is Stupid. I don't believe that, but I think it's important to make room for the discussion in a non-threatened way amongst all parties. So that is a, an exciting thing, but Helen is confirmed, Helen Thomas. Um, other events include, on April 24th, Folk Art Rajasthan will be here, and we are combining it with a, um, a world conference that is done by Baltimore's Imam Bashar Arafat with Muslim youth from around the world, Christian youth, and the local Jewish youth from, from the day schools. He's taken them all to Disney World year after year for their meeting, but he was so moved with what we're doing here that the conference will be kicked off from here on April 24th. With the Folk Art Rajasthan, one of our most amazing Muslim artists, uh, Sabur Khan, who is a drummer, will be coming to perform. Now, Sebwar, his family has been, even though he's Muslim, the resident uh, drummers in a Hindu goddess temple that has made him an untouchable from the Hindu point of view, and it makes him low man on the totem pole, heretical from the, his fellow Muslims. And what's interesting is the tourists love this sweet person. And so they would send him Hanukkah cards, they would send him Virgin Guadalupe images. Whatever was, was beautiful to their faith tradition, they would send it to Sawar Khan. And he gathered it and gathered it, and unlike the mud walls of his house, he painted pinks and oranges, and he would put all the symbols, a Krishna, Hanuman, uh, 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 the Sikh, uh, Guru Nanak, on his walls of his cave, in his home. And he said, you know, my religion is human being. And he prepared some of the images that he has on his walls he made as art for us, which you will see today. I think he is very in Rumi's spirit. And once you learn more about Rumi, now, you know, when we're dedicating this show to Rumi, it has a very personal relationship with the museum. Ever since we opened in November of two, uh, Thanksgiving uh, 1995, of all the world's wisdom and humor and insight, we have returned to Rumi over and over again. So how could we not celebrate his birthday? Can you imagine 800 years after you're born becoming the most read uh, poet, more than Shakespeare now, in both, he's taken over in both America and in Europe, most read poet. So that's quite a blessing. Now, an important thing before we begin our tour, uh, and you get to hear from all of the artists, is to introduce a real treasure to us. Um, Frank Warren lives here in Maryland. Uh, to his chagrin, he put his home address, or his wife's chagrin, not his chagrin, is on the cover of his first book, Post Secret, or right, in Germantown, correct? And um, Frank had this thing that you understand. He asked people to, to be able to share what was most secret in, in their lives anonymously through sending him a postcard. And he created a real revolution uh, by that act, a healing one. And I noticed that in his book, uh, so many of those secrets that people would send had to do with what they really think in their heart, or they really believe, and that struggle to understand the big questions. Who are we? Why are we? You know, what is our relationship to the divine? Is death an end? You know? all the big questions they were struggling with in their secrets. So as an undercurrent, and a very important one, throughout most of this exhibition run, the assemble, what, he, what Frank has curated, um, faith secrets. Uh, and some are hilarious, and some are, you know, make you cry. 
um, and he will speak more, and that's the first thing we'll, we'll deal with in this exhibition. But why that was important in, in curating the show, and, and you know, when, you, when I say from atheism to Zoroastrianism, there was no desire to try to be encyclopedic about faith, because you would need a hundred football fields to try to be, uh, to include everything. But to have enough of the essence of Native American wisdom, of Zen wisdom, of Talmud, of atheist, of ethical uh, humanist, that uh, of, of Catholic, uh, so that people could could hear things that resonate with themselves and drink in some, consider others, reject it. It doesn't matter. It's again in that spirit of freedom of, of conscience. Um, but what I found was, you know how we have this kind of naive view of interfaith dialogue where you have the Muslims and they talk to the Jews and they talk to the Christians and they have prayer breakfasts and it lasts like two and a half hours. Everybody goes home and they thought, wasn't well, that great? They, were, they weren't so bad, you know, or whatever. What is interesting is I believe that we have to get away from that stereotype of thinking that even people who self-identify as Episcopalian, you know, as you will hear from Archbishop Tutu, he, as a, 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 a gay rights activist, one of the most articulate in the country, even though he is heterosexual, um, he does not um, agree with all the tenets, even within Episcopalianism. So uh, it's very interesting. I think that Frank, the power of Frank's uh, work in this show is many fold, but particularly to underscore how deeply personal matters of faith are and not cookie cutter, no matter what people may say, oh, I'm this or that, because they're thinking, oh, you want a box. You know, you want a neat little box to put me in and my parents were this and I'm gonna to go to that kind of cemetery. But indeed, you know, these people who are saying, you know, oh yeah, I'm Baptist, that doesn't mean that they're not like, you know, going namyo hirankyo at night, you know? It's very interesting. So with that, let's, let's go see the real art, and except for I want to have first Frank come on up. <laughs>